Welcome to this um, third webinar of a series on uh, the CRA's open source implementation. Um, so why this series of webinars on the Cyber Resilience Act? Well, essentially, when we started working on the Cyber Resilience Act, we really quickly noticed that um, all of us, uh, you know, myself included and foremost, I needed to essentially be brought up to speed to really understand all of the different pieces of not only of the legislation, but also of its implementation um, and uh, really better understand our um, the impact that this legislation is going to have on, uh, on open source um, and help us uh, align as a result our path forward and see how to best contribute to the work that's ahead. Um, so we organized a series of uh, webinars into four different sessions. We started off with a session uh, that Enzo led on how to, on learning how to read um, the CRA. Uh, last week we had a session uh, where Benjamin Burgles from the um, European Commission uh, gave us uh, an overview of the CRA's obligation, in particular those that were relevant to the open source community. Um, and we're going to continue with uh, the session today and then a last session. Well, probably like there's going to be future sessions coming up, but a fourth session um, on at the end of August. Um, today's session is going to be focused on the CRA standards making and understanding uh, all of the process uh, and all of the key standards that are related to uh, the Cyber Resilience Act and uh, their production timeline. And for this today, uh, we're incredibly fortunate to have as our speaker and guest, uh, Philippe Jones Morrow, who is a policy officer at the European Con um, Commission. And I think um, was this, um, Philippe, I can, um, uh, you welcome to uh, share your screen and get started. Um, we have a chat that I'm going to be uh, following uh, as you give your presentation. And we also have uh, the Q&A that uh, normally everyone should be able to uh, add questions and answers, uh, sorry, questions and comments uh, to. And once you're finished with your presentation, I'm going to try to uh, make a coherent uh, walk through the different questions that uh, were asked during the presentation. Um, and uh, get your help in answering them. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Philip, for joining us. And uh, yeah, the floor is yours. Thanks. Uh, hi, everyone. Can you just confirm that you can see my screen? We can see your screen. We can see the, the, the whole of the presentation, uh, and uh, the, the whole of the, not just the, the slide itself, but the whole of it. Ah, hmm. OK, just a sec. Sure thing. Mm -hmm. So as mentioned, I won't be able to see uh, hands raised. So thanks, Toby, for the, doing the moderation. All right. And uh, let me know if there's perfect. any issues at the end. I'll start. Great. That's perfect. So please, please go ahead. Hi, everyone. So uh, as, as Toby said, I'm Philippe Morin. I work as a policy officer in the Cybersecurity Policies Unit, where I'm working with Benjamin, who was here last week, on the, the Cyber Resilience Act implementation file. I prepared some slides with some basic information on standardization ecosystem, especially in Europe. And uh, so sorry for the text, actually, that was a, an old presentation that, that, that I managed to reuse. Uh, so I, I hope it will be interesting for you. Um, uh, and fundamentally, I think, uh, to kind of give some, some context, I think it's useful to understand uh, where standards come from and, and what they mean when, when we say we need standards for the CRA, what, what actually that means. So um, a lot of people don't know, but the, the 19th century, which was the, the first big industrial, uh, industrial revolution, uh, spawned the development of a bunch of uh, innovations in the legal domain. Uh, one of them was, for instance, uh, antitrust law, because the, there was, you know, very big companies like actually Standard Oil was, was uh, I think, the biggest company at the time and they had to break it up. Right. So, so antitrust law was created for the first time in the 19th century and perhaps not a coincidence that the company was called Standard Oil. 
Uh, but uh, uh, fundamentally, this uh, question that standards try to, to answer is the question of liability in industrial society. So there was a bunch of new issues coming up that had never arisen before in, in uh, human societies. You had things like big factories where there might be uh, accidents. And the question would be whose fault is it when, when an accident happens in, in a big factory or train accidents. Uh, you, you had big companies starting to, to, to come up. Uh, they had big investment on infrastructure. They were connecting the whole world from east to west with trains. But then if there was a train accident, uh, when could we say that, uh, that they were liable for those accidents? That they were getting a lot of uh, economic benefits from managing the train lines. But it was hard to say that under the traditional notions of liability that they were at fault because uh, they had not intended to have the accident. So this was the big question in the 19th century of how can we use liability to make sure that there is a balance in these relationships? And the answer ultimately came down to standards. And this is when standards started taking on the current legal function. So, so the standards start to function as a kind of statement of what is the state of the art, and that is then used to define what is the expected standard of care. So when we were talking about uh, building a factory, uh, if there was something going wrong in that factory, then you would look at what are the, the documents that construction guilds would use to teach new, 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 new building workers uh, about how to build walls correctly, how to build ceilings and roofs correctly. If that had been followed, then at least the minimum standard had been followed or in developing uh, or in, in defining what is the standard of care when you are uh, um, when you're basically designing and developing your train uh, that you will put on the train tracks that, that might then go on to cause the accident. If you have correctly followed the, the engineering plan, then you know, that, that was the standard that, that should be adhered to. So in the 19th century, legal courts and also governments started looking for solutions to this problem of how do you define what is a good product when we're talking about such complex things as trains or factories. So really, in terms, the, the standards are a way of the official structures of power, uh, of going out into society and getting knowledge about how things are done. Uh, and, and today, you know, in, the, in our postmodern world, we can see this as a, as a first form of public-private cooperation. And in the 19th century, this was just starting. And standards basically represent that yeah, that, that postmodern form of governance, which is the public-private cooperation. Um, throughout the 20th century, standards were then used for evolving ends. Initially, the first half of the 20th century, standards served to make national markets. And still today, again, trains is a good example. Each, each country had their own details sometimes varying just by a few millimeters on how you should have your trains or how, how you should have your, your train tracks. Uh, you still have small variations like in cars, for instance, in the UK, they, they drive on the left. In continental Europe, they drive on the right. Well, these things were used to, to protect national markets and to protect national industries, because obviously it would be more expensive for a foreign company to have to change its processes in order to come and meet the standards uh, that were set for uh, another country. And so that would kind of protect the national markets. But after the Second World War and with the beginning of globalization, standards start to take on a different kind of uh, industrial policy function, where actually they serve to unify different national markets. Obviously, in Europe, we see that with uh, the, the European single market. And the new legislative framework that we will be discussing is, is a big part of that. Uh, but also the WTO, the World Trade Organization, played a big role in that. Uh, and in fostering this culture of valuing international standards first, uh, as opposed to having many different national competing standards uh, that would create those, those internal barriers. So standards have also served a variety of purposes in industrial policy. And really, I think we need to see ourselves as at the moment as being at, at the end of this process where, where we are more and more aware that, that uh, European companies participate in global markets and we want to make sure that any European standards are not conflicting or contradicting that. Uh, wherever at least uh, European international standards serve our needs and where they don't, then we need to find an answer to that.
Okay, so in terms uh, of standards, also taking a different type of step back, uh, perhaps you know uh, there are technical standards and that is different from technical regulations. Uh, so the standards uh, and how they were used in the first half of the 20th century was in the form of technical regulations where you would have very, very detailed and precise legislation that would have all of the technical specifications. You still have this in certain sectors such as automotive. Uh, but technical standards, they tend to be voluntary. They're, they're, they're not regulations per se. And that's what we're talking about here when we're talking about standards. Another important distinction is uh, de facto standards, such as the QWERTY keyboard versus formal standards. And formal standards are formal because they have been formalized and recognized to some extent in certain fora. And in particular, of course, there are now certain organizations like ISO, IEC at international level, or SEN, Senelec, and Etsy at European level that serve to formalize standards. It doesn't really matter where these standards came from. Sometimes they were developed inside of those organizations. Sometimes they've been developed in other places. But what matters for the purposes of these formal standards is that they've then gone through a process within these organizations that makes them formal standards. And I repeat, this is exactly what we're talking about when we talk about the European standardization organizations. It's a way of formalizing a standard for the European space. Now, another thing about standards that is well known is that there are benefits and risks to standards, and this is theorized and this is talked about, and this is going to be relevant when we think about what kinds of standards do we want for the CRA. In general, what kinds of standards do we want as harmonized European standards for European legislation? The benefits, of course, are that you get to have a statement of what is the state of the art that helps with compliance and that that helps with checking uh, that things form a, a, a minimum, that also helps with uh, uh, defining uh, a little bit what should be the state of the art, not just what is the state of the art. Uh, and that, of course, there are risks to standards as well, because uh, companies are placing uh, information on the market. There are risks to the companies and there are risks that the information is not fully complete, for instance, or that there could be collusion. There are issues with intellectual property. There's a number of, of legal risks that have happened over time. And I think it's just good to know that we are aware of those risks and we basically always are going to want to try to find a way of putting as much transparency onto the market as we can while avoiding risks. And in particular, it's going to be important having a balance between how detailed the specifications are and how open they remain. Often there is a trade-off between openness and um, the, the, the granularity of, of the specification. Um, there's also uh, some important information in terms of what types of, of standard development organizations are out there, SDOs. So there are some that are defined by territory, like the European ones. There are some that are defined by their technical scope, such as IEC that only works with electrotechnical things. ISO is the residual catch-all uh, organization. And there are some that are officially recognized, such as ISO, IEC, ITU, and others that, that are not. We usually call those industrial consortia or, or something else. Uh, but if, the, if they develop specifications, they, they can be considered SDOs as well. Uh, and in particular, then in Europe, you have SEN, Senelec, and Etsy. Uh, as I said, you know, what really defines them, I think, is the fact that they make European standards. Uh, so it's a, a process of formalization that is valid in Europe. Uh, but there's a few uh, uh, relevant points that distinguish them. Uh, and I think it's useful for, for some context and background. Um, SEN and Senelec tend to work with the kind of national delegation principle. They, they work with national delegation and EU funding, whereas Etsy uh, is, fu is funded through company participation fees. It also receives EU funding in the form of operational grants, but the main source of funding is, is the company participation fees. And then you have this question of royalties versus royalty free. Again, Sen and Senelec, they charge royalties for their standards, as you're probably very aware. And Etsy is royalty free. The standards are freely available. Okay, so in terms of the standardization process, uh, you have here the, the, uh, on the slide the prototypical um, standardization process of ISO. So things you have a proposal, there's a preparatory stage where the draft is discussed, then you have the committee stage and an inquiry, then an approval, and if there's approval, you have the publication. 
Okay, uh, and it's very similar uh, for in Sensenelec, where you have a new work item that is approved. That's the, the the proposal. You have the drafting of the proposed European norm. That's the preparatory stage. I'm going to skip the red text for now. You then have editing. You have translations and national publication for a national inquiry. So the national standards bodies get to send comments. Those comments are handled uh, in what's until you get to a stage of what's the final proposed European norm. And then you have a formal vote and you have final editing and publication again. So basically they follow the same procedures where you have an idea that is discussed, it goes through a stage of feedback and then it is approved and published. Um, in red text here in the, the Samsenelec process is added the uh, places where the Has consultants join in. So the Has consultants are a, a figure that has been set up by the European Commission to support its decision making uh, and to evaluate the content of the standards. And so the Has consultants can play an extra role here that is also included in the process, whereby during the drafting stage and once the comments are being handled, the Has consultants can come and also give their own assessment. Okay, so in the red text, what you have here would be sort of the full process of what you'd go through to do a harmonized European standard. All right, so in terms of the EU standardization framework, we have regulation 1025 from 2012, and it's been amended twice. And I think it was it's useful to give you a quick overview of this the latest amendment of 2023, because it specifically aimed to respond to some of the governance requirements and some of the concerns that were happening about how, you know, we're having these European standards, but who is actually developing them and how are they being developed? Are they being well developed? And so the point of this amendment was that the key decisions in the standardization process for harmonized European standards should be taken exclusively by the national standards bodies. So because there is participation of a lot of industry and there's participation with the idea is that there should be as much participation as possible of all sectors of society, including out of interests outside of Europe. But at the same time, there needs to be a balance because we're talking about European standards. So the idea was that the key decisions would be taken by the national standardization bodies only. So this would be decisions of whether to accept or refuse a standardization request, whether to accept a new work item, and whether to adopt, revise, or withdraw a European standard. Um, now, looking at the standardization regulation, 1025-2012, Basically, this is kind of like the table of contents of, of that regulation. And I think it's useful, again, to just give you an idea of what this standardization framework is, what's it, what it's about, okay? So you have cooperation between the national standards bodies. This is actually the key motif of the legislation. And this is often the case when you have European legislation, uh, a lot of the work is just about coordinating the member states, right? So here is exactly the same. You see cooperation between the national standards bodies and there are some provisions on uh, transparency of national work programs and of draft standards at national level. Um, then there's an, another important point often in European legislation, which is the question of stakeholder consultation. We want as much stakeholder consultation as possible. And so in the standardization framework, there are specific references to SMEs, so that it's not just big industry designing the standards. And there's, in particular, this figure called Annex 3 organizations. These are basically European associations that can represent a variety of interests. So there is an SME, uh, small business standards. There's also environmental organizations, and there are consumer organizations under this Annex 3. And there can be more. It's, it's an open-ended annex. Uh, so for instance, there could be one for, for open source. Um, then there's an annual union work program. So this is about having transparency on what standards are being developed for Europe and in Europe, reporting obligations by the ESOs. There's also some uh, articles on the standardization requests. This is how the European Commission relates to the standardization organizations. And also there's a figure of the formal objections. So national, um, national parliaments, I think, or national standards bodies can, can make formal objections to a standard if they think that it doesn't actually meet the requirements to have the presumption of conformity. So remember here, we're always talking not just about European standards, but harmonized European standards. And so member states can actually make an objection if they think the standard isn't good enough for some reason. 
Um, there's also provisions on ICT technical specifications, but they mostly refer to interoperability in, in 2012. I think that was the main concern. Uh, financing also, as I mentioned, operational grants, and there are also the action grants. We'll hear a little bit more about that. And then there's a list in Annex 1 of which are the recognized uh, the standardization bodies, which, as I've said, are SEN, SENELEC, and ETSI. Okay? And this gives you an overview of what is the, the standardization framework in Europe and what are the main concerns. Okay, We will see some of these words resurfacing during the rest of the presentation. So if you're not familiar, I hope that this gives you a little bit of familiarity with the regulation. Right. Now, characteristics of standards. So in the current EU framework, there is a general definition of what is a standard. And then there's, I think, a very useful further definition in Annex 2 on what are good ICT technical specifications. And I think this list gives a very good view of what kinds of things we value when we're talking about standards. So the first few elements, uh, bullets on this list are about the process. The process should be open, it should be consensus-based, it should be transparent, it should ensure the maintenance of the standard and its availability, and any IPR should be in fair, and reason fair reasonable and non-discriminatory terms. Uh, but then there's other uh, requirements that I think are also, well, to me actually are perhaps, well, in some ways, even more important because they're, they're harder to check. They're not just procedural, they're actually substantive. So first of all, the standards need to be relevant to the legal provisions. Then they also need to be neutral and stable. So neutrality here, we're talking about market neutrality and product neutrality. So we, it, the purpose is to avoid undue market distortion. And then they need to be, they need to have good quality and they need to have the appropriate level of detail. And again, this is going to be another of the key concerns when we're talking about, you know, are these standards good enough or what do we want out of these standards? Really, on the one hand, I think it comes down to saying, is this product as detailed as it can be without being overly prescriptive? The balance between technology neutrality and the level of granularity is going to be a key factor uh, to, to reflect upon as we go forward. Okay, and of course, then this idea of the presumption of conformity is, is really, I think, one of the main factors that, that, that makes standards interesting to us today, because the presumption of conformity comes from um, usually the, what's called the harmonization legislation itself. So when you have this product legislation, such as the CRA or the AI Act or the Machinery Directive or a bunch of other product legislation that has come out of the EU, uh, usually there's an article that states harmonized European standards can provide presumption of conformity. Okay, But what that means in practice is always going to be dependent on the legislation itself. But the figure of the presumption of conformity is why harmonized European standards are, are interesting for the purposes of industry, for, for compliance, for reducing the burden. So in terms of the legal text in the standardization regulation, a standard can be published when it satisfies the requirements set out in the corresponding union harmonization legislation. So this is a very abstract statement. Okay. And I think that's something that we basically need to, to, to keep in mind. Um, so that's why I, I, I have emphasized in the previous slide, I'll just come back to that, that these are actually, I think, the main, the main requirements for, that, that we want for technical specifications. And also for the, the ORC working group here, um, I think these are going to be things that, that are important to, to take into account when, when you do any kind of work. Uh, if you can meet these requirements, that, that's always going to be very important. Uh, so there was also some main questions that, that started to arise during work for the radio equipment directive about when this presumption of conformity, how can it happen, some specific specificities of the cybersecurity domain. So first of all, the radio equipment directive delegated act, it had uh, only horizontal provisions. So all of the products in its scope needed to have appropriate cybersecurity for uh, network security, protection of, of personal data and avoiding fraud. And so this question of the horizontal scope is in some ways antithetical to the spirit of standards. Usually standards are product specific. So when you have a horizontal provision, does it make sense to have standards? Well, you know, I think the answer has been, there's a lot of work being put into the Radio Equipment Directive. We can have horizontal standards, but that forces us to think about things in a slightly different way, because we're not making product-specific statements. So therefore, the purpose of the standard is perhaps a little bit different. Uh, so that's the, the horizontal scope. And also the question of objectivity in testing. 
In the domain of cybersecurity, some areas have already quite well-defined testing procedures, such as for cryptographic modules, but not all issues in cybersecurity uh, and the testing of those issues, not all of them are well standardized yet. So how can we deal with this fact when there is not yet a clear um, state of the art? And uh, in some ways, it's a sign that the, 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 the field still lacks a little bit of maturity in those specific aspects. Well, here we have two, two ways of dealing with this question. The first is that the standards, they don't need to go beyond the state of the art. So if there is no current testing procedures that are standardized, then we're not necessarily going to invent them now. We don't really have time right now. We want to develop this first wave of standards very quickly so that they can give presumption of conformity. So what we will do is we will take the current state of the art. Of course, objectivity is desirable. And when it exists as the state of the art, we expect to see it in the standards. But if it doesn't yet exist, then it's a bit of an open question how this can be dealt with. Uh, obviously, there needs to be some degree of flexibility by the legislator, and there is that flexibility. So the, the standardization regulation says that the testing shall be objective unless duly justified, right? So that means that if, it does, if there is no consensus, if there is no state of the art on how to have objective testing, then we need to find workarounds. And that's exactly what's been done for a lot of the aspects in the radio equipment directive, where a lot of the... the the testing is ensured through adequate documentation, for instance. It's not really the same as testing, but if we have a good framework of what needs to be documented, then it's a good step in that direction. It ensures some degree of objectivity, and at least it represents a kind of consensus view of what is the current state of the art, um, and that's what we're looking for at the moment. So ultimately, as I've already tried to say, to have the presumption of conformity, it's really going to come down to a balance between the quality and relevance of these standards, which means that they are effective, they respond to the regulatory needs, but also their neutrality. They need to allow competing implementations and they need to avoid market distortions. This is very important also because we want to support not only the open source ecosystem, but in general, we want to support innovation. So I hope that... I assume everybody on the call is very interested in the open source cause. And so I think it's good to show how even without being specifically concerned with open source, these standards already very much, I think, take open source considerations into account. Okay, so uh, just also a quick word on the harmonized standards, the actual publication process. This actually will take another three to six months on top of the development of the standards. So really, we're going to look to have standards ready basically a year before the CRA uh, obligations kick in. That, that's after the transition period. Um, but but the, the, there will be an extra time needed to actually harmonize these standards, meaning first they are developed as European standards, and then the references of those standards can be published in the official journal of the EU. So basically, this just means that the Commission has to assess the standards and decide whether or not they're suitable. It drafts a decision, it goes through an inter-service consultation that is then translated, and then it can be adopted by the College of Commissioners as a regular Commission Act, and that would then be published in the official journal of the EU. And that is the legal moment that provides this presumption of conformity. That is the act of harmonization per se, okay? But it's actually a separate process from the drafting of the standards. The standards are just regular standards, European standards. They have an extra annex where they make, um, they basically say in a table which, uh, which clauses of the standard meet which items of the standardization request. And that is the only extra thing that is needed to have a harmonized standard from the point of view of the European standardization bodies. But then it needs to go through this extra process, which is the EU process for the publication in the official journal. That's what gives it the legal effect. Okay. I think also interesting to have a quick word on this notion that there's actually evolving case law around standards and even the very... Um, the very legal status of standards has been to some extent contested over the last few years. Okay, so basically, uh, initially there was this idea that standards were just uh, a private, a private body statement that had no uh, uh, legal obligations per se, but that has been contested by the court. So in the judgment of Frabo in 2012, the, court, the European Court of Justice came to say that private law standardization bodies can actually exercise public powers and therefore certain provisions will apply to them. 
especially in this case, the free movement of goods. In 2016, the European Court of Justice again came and said, you know, in the, James, in the James Elliott case, it said that it has actually jurisdiction to interpret harmonized European standards, even though they are developed by a private body. They are not legislation per se, but because they apply legislation, then the court can interpret them. In 2017, there was a specific case law on repealing a standard when it, it, uh, when it no longer provides or should should no longer provide legal presumption of conformity. Uh, that's when, when the legislation uh, is superseded. In 2020, there was also a case, the Stichting Preventi, uh, where the obligations in, in, in the standard are stated to not be binding unless they're published in the official journal because of the importance of transparency and access to information for the rule of law. And of course, the court also said then that you know they can be published in the official journal, or, or, or uh, the, the, there can be access to the standards through the national standards bodies. Um, and then finally, recently in the publicresource.org case that came out in March this year, the court has said that there's an overriding public interest that justifies the disclosure of harmonized standards whose references are published in the official journal. And this, I think, is very important. And at the moment, the Commission is working with the European standardization bodies and also with the national standardization bodies to make harmonized standards available for free in a accessibility platform. That means you know they can be read, but they won't be able to be copied and, and, and shared outside. And that's kind of the current societal balance, apparently. Ah, actually, that's that's what this uh, this slide now now shows. So there, there as this uh, case law has been coming out over the last few years, the Commission's response has also been evolving. So standards used to be published as communication. Now they're published as legislation. There's involvement of the HAS consultants. Standardization requests have become more detailed. They have an expiry date. There's also been a task force with from the Commission and uh, Zen and Senelec defining a checklist for internal assessment of these standards to make it easier for them to be published. And as I've said now recently, uh, Commission, Sensenelec and national standardization bodies are working together to implement this free access to harmonized standards that are cited through readability platforms. Right, so um, this was the general presentation on the standardization framework. Uh, and uh, maybe I will continue the presentation because we now go into the Cyber Resilience Act, which I assume is, is the, the main point of interest. And I hope, yes, is this, was this too long? <laughs> okay. No, no, that's So CRA is, in a is, nutshell. Uh, this is perfect. I'm, I'm, I'm very much enjoying myself and I hope everyone else is too. Um, two quick <laughs> questions maybe uh, before we go yes, deeper sir. into the Cyber Resilience Act. Uh, one was sure. about uh, organizations like the ITF and ECMO. Uh, how do they sort of fit in the description of the ecosystem that you gave at the very beginning of, of your presentation? Sure, thanks. Uh, yeah, that's, that's a good question. I, that, I tried exactly to address that. So basically, those from the point of view of the European Commission, those would not be formal standards because they do not come from an officially recognized uh, SDO. So the officially recognized SDOs are the SOs and then uh, ISO, IEC, and ITU. So those would be kind of de facto standards, basically. So it's an SDO, but it does not have the same official recognition. So it would be, you know, technical scope. That's how it would fit. Wonderful. Perfect. Thank you. That's very clear. And then I had a, a second question um, about um, whether the potential standards driven market distortions are investigated and evaluated. And like, is there someone, is there like an organization within the EU that's responsible for dealing with this? So I would say that um, in general, if, if there's anyone responsible, it, yeah, I mean, I would say basically the European Commission is in charge of making sure that it only publishes the or the references of the standards that, that serve the good purposes. And if it, it turns out that they don't, then it would be the European Commission's responsibility to remove that reference or to change it. OK, but there's another uh, specific uh, way where that could be could be found through the formal objections coming from the member states that I, that I also mentioned here in the in the middle bullet point. OK, so there would be also a way for uh, member states to make an objection that the commission then needs to 
to further investigate. So this basically, as with most things in the European Commission, things can happen in a, in a decentralized way at member state level as well. And that's obviously a good thing. Wonderful. And then one last question um, uh, on the readability platform following the publicresources.org case. Um, sure. um, and, you know, sort of questions as to what kind of restrictions and reuse restrictions might be put uh, on the standards um, that are um, that would be delivered through that platform. Um, and would those be strictly technical restrictions? So preventing you from like copy pasting from the platform itself, or would they also come with legal restrictions for uh, over reuse? Such as, for example, the ability to, uh, for example, uh, take some content and add it to documentation or uh, add it to, for example, code that would be well, you know, beyond fair use, but sort of, uh, it, it, I, I suppose, for the same kind of con in the same kind of context. I have no idea. This is, I think, as 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 I say here, the the Commission is working on this at the moment with Senelec and national standardization bodies. Okay, so the the details are to be seen, and you will probably see them before I do. If you're interested in that, <laughs> I will not Wonderful. be looking yeah. for that specifically. No, yet. sure, sure, and, and I know you, this is this I, is fairly new. Yeah, exactly. It's it's still happening. It's it's still in the process of being implemented. All right, wonderful. Well, thank you very much for this. And I think you know, was that sort of a background uh, set? I think we can dive into the CRA part. Um, um, and I'll you know I'll give you the floor back. All right. Thanks, everyone. Okay. So moving forward, then the draft standardization request in support of the CRA. Uh, so very, very quickly, I mean, I know that you've had already a couple of sessions uh, with the CRA, so I'm not going to go into any details, right? In a nutshell, we want to try to have products that don't have so many holes in them, and we want to ask manufacturers to be actively working on those holes. And of course, the main way to do this is uh, the NLF provisions, right, with the essential requirements of the CRA, that ultimately manufacturers can take responsibility for their claims and affix a CE marking to their product if they say that it complies with it. Uh, I'm not going to go through the main elements of the proposal. I'm just going to say that this is actually something that's coming all over the world uh, from a lot of different places. And so we're here basically just discussing the, the European version of these considerations. And of course, that's, I think, kind of a relevant consideration when we think about, OK, yes, we're developing European standards. But it's good to try to understand that this will also be part of a global conversation. And in some ways, I think that the ORC is already contributing to that, even if the ORC, even if Eclipse Foundation is, is headquartered in Europe, which is great and is useful. But, you know, all of these conversations, I hope that they will be able to be elevated also to the international level, where there can then be a kind of further dialogue in, in order to achieve better international standards. And the tentative timeline for the CRA and also for the CRA standards is uh, that it would be published uh, soon after the summer. So uh, during autumn probably, and around the same time we would also be publishing the standardization request. Okay. And that that moment is called the moment of the entry into force. Uh, and then you have certain obligations that would kick in at different times, in particular on the, the top of this, uh, of this uh, rectangle, you have the reporting obligations that would enter into application 21 months after the entry into force and the the other provisions in particular the provisions on the essential requirements of products would enter into application 36 months after the entry into force and this is what we call the transition period okay there's a three-year transition period 36 months after the entry into force the provisions would enter into application um, and what we hope is that the, the harmonized standards would be published roughly one year before that to give companies about one year to kind of start preparing uh, based on standards. And of course, the standards are not going to cover all of the products. So we've had to make some choices about exactly what standards to include in the standardization request. And I will start talking about that in the next slides. Um, oh, but also just a word to say that this, okay, the, the CRA standards are basically one of the implementation mechanisms to support the implementation of the CRA, but there are other implementation work streams. And in particular, some of you who are on the call may have participated in some workshops that we did over the last month or so uh, 
in, to define what are the or to help to define what are the technical what the technical descriptions of important and critical products in the CRA. This is to provide legal certainty and to support uh, and support also the standardization work. A apart from other things such as just you know letting people know exactly. Uh, when the products are covered or not, that's the legal certainty part. This is also being prioritized because it can support the standardization work. And this is because the scope of the standard doesn't necessarily have to be the same as the scope of the legislation, but usually the scope of the legislation gives a certain important incentive. And so it's useful for the standardizers to not fall into bickering questions about what's the definition of this or that. It's useful that these definitions come out, the technical descriptions come out as soon as possible. And that's what we're trying to do. The statutory deadline is 12 months after the entry into force. Uh, the targeted consultations, as I said, uh, are, are still ongoing and, and we had a bunch of workshops. But the idea is that we will try to come out with a first draft for public consultation soon after the summer. Uh, yes, okay. So I also added uh, a slide here on uh, different cybersecurity standards. Uh, I mean, this uh, is not really a, a, a very strong statement. This is just something I put together basically for myself and, and I hope it can be useful for you. I'm, I'm not saying that all, all cybersecurity standards fit into these models, but roughly, you know, you have quality management standards that then have evolved into information security management uh, with the ISO IC 27000 series. Uh, in the 70s and 80s, you had the um, re secure reference implementations uh, that then evolved into the common criteria standards. You have a bunch of software standards and, and secure software frameworks, uh, such as, for instance, the ITF, uh, DNSSEC. Um, you have industry standards for network devices, such as through GSMA, 3GPP. Etsy is also a, a player in that in that kind of uh, world, and you have the ISO the IC six two four four three for industrial cybersecurity, uh, which which is some of the more recent kind of generations of standards. And I think it's really interesting that there have been a, a number of waves of standards, uh, and they all kind of have different things. They all work either for different types of products or they follow different security paradigms. And I think what the CRA can bring to this landscape is not reinventing the wheel, but you know, providing some clarity on what are the expectations of society, which I think will foster convergence of solutions and also coherence between the different frameworks. So in terms of steps taken so far um, for the CRA standardization, there's been a landscape analysis by the, the Joint Research Center of the Commission and ENISA, the European Cybersecurity Agency, where they basically took a look at over a thousand standards that exist out there and kind of tried to give a first assessment of whether they are useful and to what extent they are useful for meeting the needs of the CRA. What they concluded was that for every essential requirement of the CRA, there are already existing documents out there but there's no single document that covers all of the CRA. So basically what we expect is that, you know, some documents are more useful than others. Probably all documents will need to have some changes done to them in order to become CRA compliant. But overall, there's a big and good standardization base to work on in order to kind of provide some first, a first approximation of what is the state of the art for CRA compliance. Um, We've also been doing targeted stakeholder consultations on, on this standardization request, including having actually a public notification of the draft standardization request, where we have again received uh, feedback. And we have regular exchanges with uh, experts at uh, SenSenelec in the working group nine of, of, uh, of the JTC 13, which is the a specific working group that was set up to discuss the CRA. Um, and this draft standardization uh, request itself, the proposed approach, uh, I don't know if you have seen it and, and maybe I'll, I'll try and, and put the links in the chat in a moment when I finish the presentation so that you can have a look. Uh, but, uh, but basically the proposed approach is to build on all of these existing standards, especially the international standards, also the work that's been done for the radio equipment directive, which was a kind of horizontal work. Um, and essentially there would be a, a, a two tiered approach. Uh, we would both ask for horizontal standards and vertical standards. Uh, and these vertical standards are the product specific standards. Uh, but because we cannot cover all of the standards that are in the scope of the CRA, we would prioritize the important and critical products that, are, that is the ones that are mentioned in Annex 3 and 4. So, and I'll explain a little bit more about what, what, what I think this means. Okay, so just bear with me. Um, there's also this inspiration of um, 
the standards coming from the machine safety world. Uh, the machine safety standards were first developed in Europe in response to European legislation on product safety. And they have since kind of gone through that process of also becoming international standards. So they were internationalized and they are kind of... Uh, a good example of you know how also European legislation can sometimes help to to promote further standardization activity at international level, and these machine safety standards are organized through this concept of the type A, B, and C standards, and that was definitely an inspiration for us because safety can be kind of a fuzzy concept, a little bit like security, and this uh, structure of type A, B, and C standards has helped to lend some structure on how to deal with the problem of security in a holistic and structured and systematic way. And basically a type A standard, it, you can think of it a bit as a, as a pyramid. The type A standard just has some high level descriptions of what are best risk, risk management practices, what are some specific design pr practices, uh, really very high level stuff. And it also defines what are type B and type C standards. Then the type B standards are basically uh, horizontal standards that cover different safety mechanisms. And this is the equivalent of what's been done for the radio equipment directive where they had security mechanisms that cover more than one product. Any kind of safety mechanism can be a, a type B standard, such as if you have a, a product with, a, with a, a saw and it will is meant to be held with the hands, then there should be something between the hands and the saw that would serve as a protector, you know, and that would be a safety mechanism. And this is kind of equivalent to saying that, you know, authentication can be a security mechanism or access control can be a security mechanism. So these are descriptions of certain mechanisms that serve the purpose of safety or security in a product agnostic way. And then the type C standards would take a number of different safety or security mechanisms and they would apply them to a given product. Uh, and of course, that means it can be a much more contextualized application. And it's this type C standard, the product specific standard that really gives the or aims to give or to achieve the full presumption of conformity, the legal effect that is the desired legal effect. Uh, and so really the type C standards are kind of what we're thinking about, at least from an inspiration point of view, when we talk about the vertical standards that aim to have the presumption of conformity. And the type A and B standards would basically be the horizontal ones, okay? And again, I'll give a little bit more information about what I think this means. But ultimately for the standardization request, uh, the draft standardization request currently asks for 41 European standards and then any supporting deliverables that the SOs care to make. Things like catalogs of risks or threats, catalogs of security requirements, catalogs or taxonomies or anything else that can be useful for the ecosystem. It would be great if they can develop it. If you think that the ecosystem needs something, please come and develop it. We want to hear it. We want to see it. We want the ecosystem to step up. We want the ecosystem to have documents that it can refer to because that supports the maturity of the ecosystem. And uh, I think the last point on the standardization request uh, or the draft standardization request is that it's meant to be a first building block, okay, for an ecosystem of product security standards. So just like the machine safety standards, they have evolved over time to include now about a thousand standards, which is one type A standard, some 200 different safety mechanisms, type B standards, and then about 800 product specific standards. Okay, and these have been developed by industry and the whole structure of the type A, Bs and Cs allows industry to relatively easily take what they need from the type A and the type Bs and apply them to a new type C standard that they can then propose to the commission for harmonization. And that is very much the vision also for us here. The idea is that we would have a horizontal framework for product security and that, that may or may not achieve full presumption of conformity. That's not the point. The point is that that horizontal framework will make it easy to develop product specific security standards in the future over time as industry and the market want and need. So really this standardization request, it should be seen as just setting the first building blocks for this ecosystem of product security standards. And that's why it has the horizontal framework and also has focused on the high priority vertical standards, but further vertical standards may come with time and we hope so. <laughs>
Okay, so what I meant then more specifically by the different horizontal standards, and this is basically what is in the draft standardization request. Again, I hope you've seen it, but basically you'd have one standard for what we call the risk-based approach, okay? That it would basically be a high-level description of what it means to comply with the CRA and to take risk into account in your design and development of, of the, the security of your product. Then you have horizontal descriptions of the different essential requirements in part one. And you'd also have a, a horizontal description of the vulnerability handling requirements in part two. So that's basically the, the horizontal framework. And then you'd have vertical standards. And as I said, we would be prioritizing the Annex 3 and 4. So you'd have one standard each for the important uh, products of class 1, for the important products of class 2, and for the critical products. So that, that's for each of the product categories. That's basically what makes up the 41 elements. Okay. Again, I'll put the link in the chat in a minute. Um, and in terms of next steps, uh, so basically we hope to have soon the adoption of the request, uh, perhaps, uh, I don't know exactly if we'll manage to do it in September, I would like it. Uh, then there needs to be an acceptance of the request by the ESSOs, okay? So it, it is still a request from the commission. It can be accepted or rejected if they feel that the, re the request is not precise enough, for instance. Uh, but ultimately, if there's an acceptance of the request, we, the standards development should 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 be should should start, or maybe it will start be, be starting sooner. That might also that's also a possibility. Um, there's a there are two types of standardization requests, uh, and if it's a policy based standardization request, that means it's only based on policy documents, not on legislation. Uh, then it cannot request harmonized standards. It can only request regular European standards because harmonized standard is always associated to a legislation. So if the CRA standardization request comes out before the CRA enters into force, then it needs to be a policy-based request and it would then need to be amended once the CRA is fully adopted in order to make the request for the harmonized standards. But in this amendment, nothing of substance would change. Only It's only a formal step that would allow us to come out with the standardization request sooner before the CRA is fully adopted. Um, there's also a, an action grant that has been published. The action grant allows to give funding to the national standardization bodies and the European standardization organizations for a specific action. It's, it's more specific than their general operational grant. And we have come out with such an action grant. The NSBs and SOs have made a proposal that is currently under evaluation. So if it's a good proposal, the idea would be that this action grant would further support those activities. And as I've already tried to explain, the desired timeline is that the standards should be published one year before the end of the transition period. So that manufacturers would have one year to basically adopt those standards into their processes. And so if we start thinking backwards in that logic of having the entry into force, uh, sorry, the entry into application three years after the entry into force. We want the standards ready one year before that. Uh, the process of, of Sen and Senelec or Etsy for, uh, well, at least for Sen and Senelec for adoption of a standard is roughly one year, which means we're basically left with one year uh, from now to actually draft and develop these standards if they're not already out there. Um, and essentially, I expect that this work will be taking place over the next 12 months. Uh, and I think that this is an important point for those of you here who are interested in working on this through the ORC, because over the next 12 months is when these discussions will be happening. And it kind of depends if you want to preempt that work, then you need to be extra fast. Or if you just want to be ready to send comments to that work, in which case you maybe have a little bit more time. But nonetheless, we do hope that there will be a kind of stakeholder consultation period uh, about halfway through the, the drafting period. So we're hoping that that will take place around April. So um, the more that you are ready and thinking about these things, I think the better your comments will be. And of course, you know, from our side, from the European Commission, uh, I certainly stand ready to help as much as I can and to support your reflections and to have engage in discussions with you, to help you with any questions and to kind of come up with as much as possible. We want to have a reasonable statement of what is the state of the art with the least amount of effort possible. Because of course, this is going to cover a lot of things, a lot of people. We don't want to have too much um, new stuff coming up at this stage. What we want is just that the CRA can serve as an incentive to start leveling up instead of leveling down. 
Okay, so it's the beginning of a new approach to cybersecurity overall, where standards, and there's now a market incentive, or there will be with the CRA, a market incentive for not only to have standards for all products, but also that those standards keep uh, getting maintained and revised and updated according to the evolving state of the art. That's the general idea. And I think that covers the end of my presentation. So if you have any questions, I'm happy to take them. I guess I'll try and keep the, the, the presentation here in case any of the questions focus on specific aspects that are on the slides. All right, thank you so much. This was, uh, this was great, incredibly helpful. Uh, lots of um, interesting questions that I'm gonna get to. I also shared, I had the link to the draft uh, standard request. So I already shared that in the chat earlier on. Um, I, uh, let me see, I had uh, a few that were, yes, you were just mentioning, um, uh, sort of like following on your last comments uh, about working on, on the standards. Um, um, Anthony Harrison, uh, was asking if all or most of the CRA is covered by existing standards, why not just create a mapping from CRA to the existing standards rather than writing new standards? Yeah, thanks for the question. Well, first of all, that's exactly what we've already done. That's what, what I call the landscape analysis, okay? And then, as I also explained, the existing standards, they all contribute, but none of them are necessarily sufficient. And especially, they're not sufficient to cover all of the product types, okay? So you might have certain specific products or product categories that are very well covered, and that's very good. And in that, those cases, we hope to just take those on board and easy peasy. But the real challenge is how can we extend those statements of the state of the art to other products that had not been beneficiaries of such discussions? So that's where I think most of the work will be. But indeed, the, the point is exactly to do that, to take all of the existing work and just formalize it into a coherent whole that would apply to a, as much as possible to, to yeah, basically to as, as large a scope as possible. Um, and then uh, two sort of like tied questions. Uh, one that asks, do products with digital elements which are not on the list, Annex 3 and 4, need to apply harmonized standards or can developers just use any standards they want that is covering the same requirements? Okay, that's, so actually, that's actually two really... different two different questions in one. Uh, that's actually a very important, touches on a very important question, that these harmonized standards, they are still voluntary. I'll let that sink in for a few seconds more. All of the harmonized standards are voluntary. The process of harmonization of the standard lends it a specific legal effect, which is called a presumption of conformity. It means that it is assumed that you are complying if you follow this specific standard, but you can comply through any means that you wish. In some cases, there may be an additional burden if you choose not to follow the harmonized standard where the harmonized standard exists, okay? So in particular, the class one products in, in Annex 3, uh, these here, the important products of the class one in Annex 3, they say, if you have a harmonized standard and you follow it, then you don't need to go to a notified body. That means you don't need to do any third party conformity assessment. You can just self assess based on the harmonized standard. Okay. But if there isn't a harmonized standard, or if you choose not to follow it, then in that case, only in the important products class one, you would be asked then to take your design documents, your technical documentation, and have them checked by the notified body. Okay. So if you follow other standards, or if you decide to not follow any standards, that's fine. You can still place the CE marking. It's just the manufacturer's responsibility, okay? But the legislation asks the manufacturer in this specific product class to go to the notified body. In product class two, important product class two, even if you have an, a harmonized standard, you would still have to go to a notified body, okay? And then in the products that are neither critical nor important, they can always just self-assess. And in that case, having a harmonized standard might still be useful because it's, there's a, an assumption of a lower burden, right? It's, it's a statement that has been legally recognized of compliance for the CRA. 
So if you can follow the harmonized standard, usually that's a good incentive and manufacturers would want to follow it. But again, it would always be only voluntary. Wonderful, that's a very detailed answer. Uh, thank you so much. Um, following up on this, um, uh, there's a question, what will happen with the supply chain? What if you have components that are not following the standards and it's really very difficult to achieve the goals? Yeah, that's a really important point as well that the CRA tackles beautifully, I, in my personal opinion, which is it just covers the whole supply chain. So therefore, you know, all products and all components need to also be CRA compliant. So I think the way to answer your question, it will depend on, on the, the, the specific cases, right? Because the, the products that will be standardized, they are at different levels of the supply chain. In some cases, you have standards for chips. In other cases, you have standards for like uh, uh, smart home speakers, right? So obviously, these are in different places in the supply chain. And I think that for, to have a standard for a smart home speaker with a virtual assistant, then you'd need to kind of assume that all of the components also follow the CRA standards. Uh, sorry, also follow the CRA, also uh, implement, or yeah, that they comply with the CRA, right? And maybe there are specific differences of different ways to comply or different components that you might have or might not have. And the standards will try to take that into account. Um, so yeah, that's, that's basically how I suspect it will need to be tackled. But essentially, if it's a legal obligation, you can assume for the purposes of your standard that, that it's being complied with, right? So when you make a statement, the manufacturer shall integrate only compliant of such and such component, that's fine, right? Because in theory, the component needs to comply with the CRA. Yeah, there's a follow-up comment um, about Benjamin saying last week that components must not be CRA compliant. And I'm not sure that's exactly what he said. I think there was a nuance components, here yeah. that I might so be there, missing. There is a, yeah, there is a nuance. So you can integrate. So. The, <laughs> The components, uh, if they're not placed separately on the European market, then they're not subject to the CRA, okay? Which means that if you make a washing machine, and you, you, it, you assemble it in Asia, and you just bring the washing machine into Europe, then you are responsible for the, for the whole washing machine, including its components, but your statement of responsibility only covers the whole washing machine which means you are not individually responsible for each component, but you do have a general due diligence obligation in the integration of third-party components. So, you know, the obligations of the CRA are somehow reflected through this provision onto the requirements, but it's not that the manufacturers of those components are directly subject to the CRA. So this is the specific case where a component may not meet the CRA requirements if the component itself was not placed on the European market. And for that, usually the assembly of the product has to take place outside of Europe. All right, but so- The, uh, the this, responsibility this is... of the manufacturer may, remains, right, for the whole product, including the, the obligation of due diligence in third-party integration. So the manufacturer still needs to make sure that those components meet the security needs for the security claims that it makes. Okay, but it's true, technically, it's true that those components don't need to meet the CRA requirements. Now, if you, if you can meet the, the CRA requirements for the whole product and not meet the CRA requirements for a component, then it's lucky, right? So in that case, it's possible. Right, um, uh, thank you. And I think that, you know, uh, uh, this is kind of uh, echoing essentially concerns that uh, people have about open source um, uh, like components not being subject to the CRA um, and then being uh, used inside a different product. And what does that, what, what does that yeah. imply? Yeah, maybe um, I can say more to uh, that. Sure, I think that would be great. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so I think that this is why, this, this is probably where we will see the Brussels effect, right? Because the, basically any product that is meant to be placed on the European market now its components or the manufacturers of its components now have at least some incentive to make their own products CRA compliant, even if they're not directly uh, um, 
even if they're not directly oblig obligated to, if because they're not placing their components on the European market, they're just giving them to someone who will place an end product on the European market. So that creates a kind of chain effect, right? And it's the same for the open source community. I think this is why you are all here, right? Because you understand, I hope you understand, that there is now an incentive for you guys as much as possible to comply with the CRA. And of course, especially non-commercial open source has been excluded and that's fine. But what that means is that the complication of complying is being placed on your on the integrators, on, on the first wave of companies that integrate the open source components. And if you want your open source components to be integrated into others' projects, then you, you're going to want to make them make it as easy as possible for them to comply with the CRA. Because if you, in fact, if you if it's actually impossible for them to comply with the CRA, then they're not going to integrate your component, right? So I think this is the this is what's going to happen on the market. Everybody's going to start to have an incentive to at least facilitate others' compliance with the CRA. So, yeah, uh, all I asked earlier whether there were funding uh, for assisting uh, the commission uh, in um, essentially its help um, you know, in, in, in its assessment of those standards, et cetera, right? So if, if essentially, I, I think the, the broader question is, um, how can um, 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 developers, organizations uh, get supported um, uh, to participate in the standardization effort or um, uh, also maybe in some of the consultations uh, that you mentioned? Yeah, so... Um... Uh, so actually, I think all this question was specifically about the Haas consultants, and in the Haas consultants, there's a specific framework contract with the Haas consultant organization that organizes oh, individual possibly. experts. That will come. But so, so for that case, I don't think that's not really something that uh, that there is open funding for. There is an, a, a public procurement process to have a framework contract, and then the experts get paid by that organization that is selected. Uh, so in the in the current case, it's Ernst and Young, uh, and th there may be there, there may be some variations on on this theme over the next couple of years when, as we as we need to go through this process. Uh, but fundamentally, I, I think the Haas consultants is not the right place for you to to put in your expertise. Um, so at least as a group, maybe one of you individually could become one of the Haas consultants. Of course, that's very welcome, but that's not going to be through the commission. That's going to be through whatever organization has the, the framework contract. Um, and the broader question that I think Toby formulated about, is there funding to participate in these things? Well, um, the European Commission, so we have actually uh, started the project. So we issued a call for proposals for, for a project that has now been selected and has started. It's called CyberStand. The website is cyberstand.eu. And I'm going to try to um, write that on the chat. Uh, I don't know if I'll stop sharing screen, but I've been now finished the presentation. So do, do, do chat here. So that is cyberstand.eu. So take a look at that. Uh, that should allow individual experts, should support individual experts in participating in the standardization efforts. Um, yeah. Um, so that's one thing. And of course, they will also be, uh, they're, they're, not, they're asked basically to organize these open calls for experts, but also to um, support debate around the standards and to support um, general general discussion also on guidelines and, and other supporting elements, uh, pedagogical elements, anything that would be useful to help with CRA compliance and with raising awareness and, and all of that. So CyberStand I think can be a useful project and especially if you as an organization or your organization wants to get in touch with them to understand how to better cooperate oh, super encourage that that's that would be super cool of course uh, but the specific funding I think that those open calls will, will be ways of, of funding targeting individual experts we are now that we are funding that project we are no longer funding other projects uh, for that that, that is that is going to be the gateway uh, of, of funding for these activities that, that we have foreseen. Wonderful, yeah. Uh, thank you so much for sharing this. That's actually very useful. Um, um, and I think uh, two quick, uh, one question about 
to, tool, tools to build open source software, sort of like tools for the supply chain itself. Hmm. Um, um, uh, like what's the status of those, right? So example, like test frameworks, compilers, et cetera, uh, are these like, how are these going to be assessed and considered um, uh, by the CRA itself? Are they subject to the CRA? Does it depend on what kind of tools they are? Do they have like specific, like additional um, requirements, et cetera? Hmm. Okay, well, that's actually quite a complex uh, question to answer because you don't give a specific example. So I'm going to try to kind of think up a few examples of my own uh, and to give the answer according to the example. But if I miss a key example that you have in mind, let me know. So, uh, so, so it could be that a specific tool that is developed and then placed on the market is subject to the CRA, right? Because any piece of software potentially is subject to the CRA uh, unless it falls within the exclusion of the non-commercial open source, right? In that case it's excluded from the CRA. And then you have, of course, just a general incentive to facilitate compliance, but that's that's separate. But if it's being placed on the market as a commercial thing, then it would be subject to the CRA like any other software application, okay? And in that case, yes, all the essential requirements would potentially apply to it. And you could even come to a point where you want to develop a standard for it just to kind of have a statement out there of what is good compliance of the CRA just to make your own life easier that way we all know we're following the standard. If it's published in the OJ, then no more questions will be in principle asked. I mean, they could be asked if there's a big problem arising, but that's the presumption of conformity is not like, you know, a legal guarantee of, of conformity, but it means that, you know, now the burden of proving that, that it's not conformant. I mean, that people are only going to look if there's only something very egregious happening, right? Um, so that's one thing. Uh, if you mean... Um, I think that's the main case. No, what uh, what what else would be? Those are the two main things. Either it falls within the exclusion and therefore it's not in the CRA scope, or it doesn't fall within the exclusion and therefore the CRA applies. Yep. I mean, you know, I, I think that pretty much covers it. I, I don't. Essentially, there's somewhere. also no additional requirements, right? Like, it, it doesn't seem that there are additional requirements for um or or do any of tools that would be sort of part of the supply chain fall as one of the um, uh, specific um, categories of important or critical? I also don't think so, right? I don't think so, but I would really let you tell me, you know, like um, if you identify anything like that, then yeah. I mean, okay. really, I hope fundamentally, this is why we're engaging with the ORC, is that we see you as a potential group of experts who may potentially be willing to come out with some statements about what is the state of the art. That's what we're really interested in hearing. And so, you know, go out and, and look at the text and tell us if you think that there's something there that, uh, yeah, that strikes your fancy or that that raises any concerns. You know what? I think we're going to end on a question just specifically around this. Now that you brought that up, like, what is our what is the group's best way to uh, uh, interact uh, with this process and to provide its expertise? Is that for me? Yes. Okay. So, um, hmm. so basically, I think there are two or three main ways that I would foresee that, that you can participate. And going from, yeah. So the, the, the perhaps the least interesting would be that you are basically discussing CRA, CRA standards in your own kind of tempo. And then when a draft comes out of the standards, you get ready and very quickly you provide comments on that draft. That's one way, okay? So, and as I said, we have specifically foreseen one kind of point of external stakeholder consultation. So this is something we insisted on because we know that there are some issues of access of stakeholders to the standardization work itself. And so to kind of help to overcome that as a hurdle, we've said, please make sure that, you know, halfway through the drafting stage, you come out with a kind of document that basically explains a bit what you're doing and asks any questions, checks any feedback, sees if everybody agrees with your approach. So at that moment, that would be very good if you can provide your feedback. That's that's the, that's the easiest. Now, another way that you could participate is that you yourself start to think, and again, this is where, this is exactly, I think, where I would be most interested to, to support you, would be, okay, actually we would 
we think of our own products and we think maybe our products are a bit different from what they might be doing there in the standardization for uh, because it's closed source companies. And so we're going to try to come up with our own technical specification of what the CRA compliance would mean for us. Okay. And of course, that would be most relevant for any vertical products, right, that are specifically contemplated in the standardization request. So I'm thinking of things like password manager or a browser or an operating system, right? So, um, those pieces of software, we have asked for standards for them. So if you come up with your own statement of what you think is the state of the art in terms of secure design and development of that product category, I think that that can be very useful as at least a baseline. That kind of gives information not only to the standardizers, also to the commission and to the whole of society of what you think is the state, the state of the art. And that can be a sort of baseline. Okay, it can be like your red lines, what you think really should not be touched or should be included. You know, it can, this can have a variety of, 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 yeah, of um, elements in there. It's really up to you to kind of decide what you think should be inside. And again, I'm happy to participate in dialogue with you to kind of further define a little bit what that means. Because as I, as I said in the slides, we've been engaging every two weeks with the experts in the working group nine, trying to kind of elucidate what we have in mind, right? By now they've had a year of that and you see my level of detail in my presentation. This is what they've been receiving for a year. So, you know, it's a bit like we want to kind of give that to others who are also interested to kind of engage in the same type of work. So if you're interested, I'm happy to try and discuss what that could mean for you. Um, so that's the second way to, to participate. So that's just generally making a state of the art uh, a statement about what you think is the state of the art. And there, I think there's also some important timing considerations because the sooner you get that out, the more likely you are to influence the process of the drafting itself, okay? And the earlier you can influence that process, the more likely it is that your considerations will be taken on board. And so for that, I would really encourage you guys to come up with something over the next few months, right? If you can come up with something until the end of the year, I would say it seems quite likely that it will be easy for them to take it into account because they're probably only going to start really putting things seriously on paper after the new year, I would say. So, you know, it kind of gives you an interesting idea of what kind of window there is just to shape the discourse, you know, just to shape the debate. And so I think, yeah, that is a good element. And then I think another way to participate is just to actually go in and say, maybe, you know, if Eclipse Foundation becomes a... Um, a liaison organization, or one of your companies, uh, the, the company that you work for becomes uh, associated to this work, maybe at the level of a national standardization body, then you can participate directly in the discussions and you can serve as a kind of intermediary between the discussions that take place in the ORC and the discussions that take place in the standardization forum. And you can help not only to kind of have a little bit of document exchange maybe, or you can certainly bring the documents of the ORC into that group. Obviously we will be trying to do that anyway, but the more people are in there that are participating in the two fora, you know, the more, the more they are, um, they be, the, the more they will become coherent, I assume. That's a perfect answer. Thank you so much. And, uh, and thank you so much for your offer to collaborate was, uh, the this working group um, to 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 drive this work forward. Um, uh, I, I think um, we're gonna close uh, this uh, webinar uh, here today. Um, you know, thank you again, uh, Philippe, for for joining us and for your presentation. We'll be sharing the slides um, and the recording uh, uh, soon. Um, and um, and then I'm just going to share my screen so that I can talk about. Um, our resources and uh, also um, the upcoming um, the, the 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 last webinar in the series. So we ran uh, um, how to read the CRA two weeks ago. The CRA obligations was Benjamin um, last uh, week, and today uh, Philippe was our guest on the CRA st uh, standards making. We're going to have a um, an additional session at the end of August on the 29th on um, the uh, um, essentially the, the implementation, all, all of the other aspects of the implementation. So the guidelines, the, the attestations, and the other key documents. Um, and um, yeah, just uh, you know, a few references uh, uh, that you're gonna find on the deck. Uh, mailing list, we have office hours every Tuesday. We're gonna be adding a weekly call. Uh, weekly calls actually really soon. 
Uh, GitLab that I've linked to. You also find all of the information on the webinar and all of the web webinar resources there. Um, and as uh, you've been using, yeah, mailing list and the um, uh, matrix chat service and an information hub around the CRA that we're uh, busy um, working on, I'll, I'll be sharing more uh, about this very soon. Um, all right. And so, uh, you know, was this uh, uh, said and done? I'd like to thank again our guest today, uh, Philippe, uh, for joining us. And I'm um, uh, looking forward to talking to you soon. Uh, bye for now.